What is up, everybody? It is Alex from Heavy New York calling from the quarantine zone again. And after three long years, we return with Dan Jacobs of Atreyu. Great to be able to talk with you today, man. It's great for you to be here. You too, Alex. It's a pleasure to do this again. Yeah, I can't believe it's been three. It feels like only yesterday we were at the Spine Farm office uh, promoting In Our Wake. So uh, it's amazing how time flies. Yeah. Yeah, especially with this uh, the whole COVID thing. It's kind of uh, stretched it out a little bit further. Yeah, I know. I, please, we got to relive those great times and uh, play at St. Vitus again. That was a fun time. Yeah. Yeah. But a lot has changed since we last spoke. We got the new album, Baptized, <clears throat> scheduled to come out this June. First question is, you know, with the first three singles that you released off of this, is this maybe a good representation of what the entirety of Baptized is going to sound like? Or is that just the scratching the surface and there's a lot more to be heard on it? I'd say more of a scratching the surface. I mean, uh, the album kind of goes all in kind of all different directions, you know, with all staying in the same universe and sounding like a cohesive record. It, yeah, I mean, what we put out so far, some of it's <clears throat> some of the more upbeat, little kind of crazier songs, um, trying to represent, a, you know, a little bit of the last record kind of coming into this one. <clears throat> and, uh, yeah, I think this record in particular, it's got a lot of uh, a lot of more powerful moments, I'd say, collectively than than the last record. I mean, the last record sounded <clears throat> big in its own right, but this um, this album we pushed a little bit harder to kind of sound <clears throat> excuse me sound a little bit bigger and uh, more epic um, collectively, and uh, you can kind of hear that through the rest of the songs, which uh, are not fully represented with what we put out so far because it is <clears throat> a very diverse record. Yeah, well, I mean, we we talked about it before, but like I've always said that Atreyu's music is as diverse as it gets. I mean, I remember with uh, the last album, In Our Wake, which was a phenomenal album, but like to have a song like Paper Castle combined with a song like uh, Terrified with the title track, In Our Wake, there's always different vibes and different sounds. So it always seems like Atreyu's always trying to step into new territory, right? Yeah, and especially on this record, you know, having um, <clears throat> parted ways with our original singer, Alex, left a lot of room uh, a void if you will to uh try new things to kind of fill that space uh and, and being that we're um you know didn't want to bring in any new members vocally we just wanted to use what we already had at the table um we kind of had to reinvent ourselves a little bit and and just kind of i don't know try things we've never tried before uh that we've had in our back pocket uh you know this kind of gave us that opportunity to do that do you so do, being that it is kind of like a bridge in a way, but you don't just consider this like a direct continuation of In Our Wake, right? It is also like a a new era for Atreyu, if you will, with Brendan really uh, stepping into the forefront from behind the kit. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, with, with with every Atreyu album, uh, that never no album sounds like the one before it. You know, it, there there'll be similarities. Uh, there'll always be those Atreyu ingredients. But every record, you know, intentionally sounds different than the last. Uh, it's it's you'll never hear one record where like, oh, this is so exactly just like the last one, you know. But um, we like to keep people on their toes and keep it interesting for us. And I think there's, like I said before, there's a little bit more of a grandeur to this this album. Um, it just feels bigger to, than anything we've ever done, really, to be honest. Um, just from the you know the choices of melodies and even the breakdowns and heavy parts are heavier the the choruses are even bigger um the solos are even a little bit more um <clears throat> a little bit more methodical and um a little more soaring at times so yeah everything about it was just kind of like a how can we do you know we don't want to do what we did on exactly on inner wake but how can we do something bigger than what we've done before yeah. Well, when you like have all these different sounds and these different styles, do you ever go into the studio or like songwriting with a preconceived idea, or is there kind of like a lot of uh, improvising involved and just like a lot of trial and error? It's a little bit of both. I mean, we have, you know, it, we never typically just go in raw where we have zero idea of what we're going to do that day. Usually, uh, myself or Brandon or Porter or Travis um, will bring something in. Uh, usually, it's a in most cases, a chorus idea, you know, like a chorus chord progression or uh, melody or a lyrical idea, maybe a riff to go along with it or something. And then um, we all then, whoever's brought stuff in that day, we all kind of pick which ones we're feeling the most at that moment. And then we will take that and then just kind of start going to town on it until it turns into a song, which is 
usually happens pretty quickly. It's something that, you know, we've been pretty good at for for a long time. It was putting together songs pretty quickly. Within a matter of hours at most, uh, we have something pretty much tracked out and mapped out and written almost in, entirely. And being, and in addition, because, you know, Brendan, come, you know, stepping up as the full-time front man, I, I've been calling him, my nickname for him has been the Metalcore Dave Grawl, actually, that's what I've been uh, calling him. But, um, you know, having yeah, Kyle... Phil Collins. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, but uh, also Kyle Rosa coming in on the drums, did maybe rhythmically, did he bring something new to the table with Atreyu as well? Um, not so much. I mean, in referring to Kyle, he hasn't brought anything rhythmically on the record yet he didn't uh, only to say because he just didn't play on the last record Brandon played all the drums uh, aside, aside from the Travis Parker moments but um, yeah I mean uh, you know bringing Kyle in you know especially having you know Brandon be up front now he's coming off the drums uh, Kyle is a very even though he's not the same exact style drummer as Brandon they have, they have their own flavors um, but he's a similar kind of vibe as far as the way that he plays and stuff so it, it's um, you know it feels you know, when we're up there playing with them and stuff, it, it feels familiar. It doesn't feel like we brought in some like blast beat metal drummer to come in who is good, but doesn't really feel like an Atreyu kind of a, in the groove, in the pocket, Dave Grohlish kind of drummer, really. I mean, that, that is kind of a good way of putting it. Like Dave Grohl is an incredible drummer, but he's not like some ripping blast beat shredder drummer. He's just this great rocking, just has a great feel to him drummer. And uh, Kyle is hundred percent. That guy is incredible at what he does. And, um, you know, because we do have him doing what he does and Brandon doing what he does and being able to play drums as well as Kyle being able to play and Brandon, you know, everyone's multi-instrumental people. Uh, it allows us to switch things up live where uh, we'll do stuff where, because, you know, a lot of fans that are older might be like, oh, man, I don't get to hear Brandon play the drums anymore. It's like, uh, I wouldn't be too sure about that, you know. We, uh, we definitely still uh, feature him on the drums for a song or two uh, just to change it up and then um, on those songs, you know, we'll have Porter come up front and then we'll have Kyle Rose jump on bass. And uh, it's just a dynamic we've never done before or tried before with the Trey U, but it's something we've had in our back pocket. And just uh, with this new lineup that we have, it's something that we can do now. So we figure, why not? Let's have some fun. Hell yeah. Uh, I don't know if you heard of the upcoming rock band from Brazil, <laughs> Ego Kill Talent, um, but uh, they, uh, uh, it's the former drummer of Sepultura. But like it's, uh, oh, okay. but um, it's the great rock band. Their uh, last album is epic. But when they play live, everybody rotates instruments. Everybody takes a different role on it. So uh, it's fun. I love it. Yeah. So the, maybe you and Ego Kill It Sound could do a tour called like the Alternate Universe Tour or something like that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, a lot of bands are capable of doing stuff like this, but they just don't, for whatever reason, they just don't do it live. They just kind of in the studio they'll switch instruments to get you know get the right takes and. And things, but um, you know, it's a whole other thing to go live and be like, you know what, I'm, I'm gonna put down my guitar and go play drums for a song or whatever. Just to, it just kind of makes people be like, oh crap, I didn't know they could do that. There's a lot of things about the musicians we like that we didn't know that they're capable of. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah, uh, a question I have about your guitar playing though is being that a trade <laughs> consists of both very aggressive vocals and very melodic vocals. Do you almost? adjust your guitar playing to sort of fit the vocal style that's involved like do you have to like use more distortion for the heavier parts use more uh clean guitar tones for the clean vocals or does that not really uh take into account on how you approach the riffs um a little bit you know it, you know there's always you know dynamic factors that come into play where you want if you want something to feel heavier you know there's certain things you can do to whether it be having you know heavier guitars or um, you know, even bringing down to clean guitars, if you want something to feel a little bit more, you know, chill or something like that, and you don't want it to have as an aggressive of a sound, but, um, but there's at the same time, there's stuff you can do where you have heavy guitars with singing over it and you can have really mellow guitars with screaming over it. So it's, it's all just kind of depending on what you're, the paint, the picture you're trying to paint audibly at the time, you know, uh, whatever kind of, yeah, feel you're trying to go for, you just kind of. You know, initially, a lot of times it starts off with just an acoustic guitar or something. Because if any good song, if you can play it on an acoustic guitar and, and it's and it translates easily in one way or another, like you you know you probably have a pretty decent song on your hand as opposed to if you try to play it acoustically and it just sounds kind of weird or doesn't really make sense or it's not yeah. But um, yeah, so I guess we kind of take that approach 
you know, when writing anything, I might, you know, initially write it on an acoustic or something just to get the concept down. And then from there, you can kind of decorate it a little bit more by adding layers of, you know, cooler guitar work over it. Or, um, or sometimes the riff itself is good enough and you can just write it as it is. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm hoping that one day, because Paper Castle, I mean, I've mentioned it before, but that after hearing that, that might be my favorite Atreyu song ever in the catalog. I know it's kind of a deep cut in your long list of catalogs, but I need to hear an acoustic version of that song one day, please. If you, if it... Sure, well, now that, um, I mean, with our current lineup, we're a little bit more, uh, we have a little bit more um, room to try things like that. So, uh, you know, we, we uh, definitely will. Awesome. Um, in addition, uh, one more question about your guitar playing is, you know, every band that has two guitar players, they always have that one member who's a real theoretical guy. Is either you or Travis, like, have any theor theoretical background that maybe you apply to your guitar playing, or are you both completely self-taught? I mean, starting from the <coughs> hardcore scene, I think I may already know the uh, answer. Neither of us are too educated on that stuff. We don't, we're kind of more of a play-by-ear, but if there was a person like that between Travis and I, it would definitely be more Travis. He, uh, he has a little bit more um, of a, a background when it comes to like, taking lessons and stuff. I actually have a weird story about Travis and I taking guitar lessons um, that we didn't find out till years later. That's super strange how you know things syncopate or whatever, um, how the universe works or however you want to look at it. But um, my I was taking guitar lessons back in the day from this guy named, his name was Mark Ween. And he played in this band called Girl on Top. Nothing special or anything, it was just what was going on at the time. And fast forward like years later, um, I was, Travis and I were talking about the teachers that we took guitar lessons from because we lived in, you know, similar areas to an extent. And uh, he was telling me about how his guitar teacher was in this band called Girl on Top. And I was like, wait, no way. Your guitar teacher and my guitar teacher were in the same band together? We didn't even know this until just right now. Like we were being taught by two guys in the same band. We're teaching Travis and I when we were younger how to play guitar. Travis and I didn't even know each other, or even that each other existed. And then fast forward years later, we just happened to come up in conversation and realize that we were taking guitar lessons from two guys in the same band. Uh, you know what? I'm not surprised. That just seems like to be an Orange <laughs> County, California metal thing now because of how like incestuous the whole uh, California uh, Orange County scene is. Like this, 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 that's an awesome story. But it's also like, yeah, every every musician in Southern California seems to know each other as well. Yeah, at this point, yeah, it's, it is a small, like, you know, it's like when you're in high school, it's like, a you know, there's, you know, if you were into punk or whatever, like, there was the punk kids, there was the metal kids, and they kind of all, for the most part, like, it was like, the music people all hung out together, you kind of knew that was your tribe, you know, and um, there's only so many people like that, and then, you know, when you reach out to other high schools in the area or colleges or whatever, there's those little tribes in each one, and you eventually, when you're going to shows, all the shows are is just groups of each of these tribes all coming together to go, watch the same collective bands that they like uh so you just if you're in a band there's only so many bands doing what you do in that scene you know so you, you end up just playing shows with all these people and um getting to know them you know pretty early on and it was just kind of how how it went you know yeah and well what i've always thought was great about atreyu as well is that i've <laughs> thought that you guys really bridged a lot of gaps together because I know punk kids who listen to you and, and I remember Brandon mentioned this when we talked at Spine Farm like you've done Ozfest and Warp Tour you've done your Lamb of God tours you've done your Taking Back Sunday tours and I think like you know like you there you you have songs that like I feel like are always able to be there for people in great times and in, you know rather terrible like Storm to Pass is definitely a song that relates to the times we're living in now but you know as soon as this shit is over and we can go back to our lives. You bet your ass I'm playing blow and right side of the bed as soon as I uh, <laughs> exit my apartment. So like, I think you, you I feel like Atreyu has always been a band that kind of uh, bridged a lot of gaps and, you know, threw all notions of boundaries out the window. Yeah, I mean, for us, it, it's a really important to have that in our music because I, um, you know, especially when we were younger, we were, everyone in our band was in all different bands. You know, we, you never were in just like one band. You'd be in like three, four bands. And, uh, but collectively our, the one band that it was the most successful that seemed to have the most weight behind it was Atreyu. Um, out of all the bands, us and, you know, everybody in my band and other bands were in, Atreyu was the one that were like, if we're gonna have any shot of real success, that seems to be the one band that has the, the best shot. So if we're gonna do this one band and we're gonna put everything we got into this band and try to make something of it, the one thing that we, are all going to need to have to be happy is a little bit of our flavors of the, of the different types of musics we like 
within it, you know, at the, the core root of it being hard rock, you know, metal, hardcore, whatever you want to look at it. But um, at the end of the day, like we all love so many different styles of music and, um, you know, it's, it's, we have so much material always to write because there's so many styles of music we want to put in our music and we can only do so many songs per record. And, you know, it's just, it's a slow process to, uh, it's a slow drip putting new music out. Um, but um, yeah, because of it, we, you know, we have this really diverse kind of eclectic sound because we just want to mix so many different genres and eras of music uh, all together to get uh, all of us satisfied with what we're doing. Yeah, I almost feel like every uh, album that you have can almost represent like a different decade of music in a way. Yeah, hell yeah. In a lot of cases, you can uh, you can kind of hear what we were listening to a little bit more at the time, um, you know, based on each record you're listening to. Um, whether we've you know leaned in like power ballad directions or even kind of like the song Lead Sales Paper Anchor, uh, where we added kind of like lap steel guitar and kind of almost gave it this kind of country swagger to it. Uh, but at the same time being a tray you and not being a country song at all yeah um so there's a i don't know we just kind of go all over the place without without steering too far away from our roots you know like there's you know we'll we'll, we'll kind of we still have our, our, our feet you know strapped to the ground we just kind of go you know within a certain radius around our roots and um you know no matter how obscure we get or whatever there's always those core tree elements are always there you know whether it be the the breakdowns or the guitar solos or the the, the multiple vocalist dynamic, the heavy vocals, the clean vocals. There's just a, you know that the the epic kind of classic rock style things that come in here and there. Um, we all those things are always there. Well, do you channel a different energy into your guitar playing when you do like a very melodic song like "When To Our One," for example, or like "Storm to Pass"? That's very you know driven on melody versus you know a song that kind of goes all out like i feel like uh this flesh is a tomb or like uh you know even um x's and o's like it almost seems like you know you have your very aggressive side is it almost like you almost use your ins uh, your instrument to express many different emotions and maybe express different sides of you right do you almost maybe use these different styles of songs to represent different sides of who you personally are absolutely uh, like i was saying before there's we love so many different styles of music and like we only put out so many songs at a time and it's only so digestible to do so, you know? So, you know, there's a lot of creativity and um, just a lot of musical ammunition just sitting in the tank, just waiting to get used. And it's why, you know, everybody in my band, especially myself, uh, I, I guess everyone really in our band, outside of our band writes for a lot of other bands and does other projects and things here and there. Um, because we, we are such creative people and we do love writing music so much that, you know, we can only do so much with our own bands. So we have to kind of get it exfoliate by working with uh, other bands and, uh, you know, getting our creative aspects out that way. Yeah. And I have uh, two more questions for you. Um, we're going to go old <laughs> school. We promoted the new album, but I do need to bring this up. But next year, 2022, is going to be the 20 year anniversary of the debut of Suicide Notes and Butterfly Kisses. I mean, kind of like two questions in one. But first off, can you potentially maybe see a trade doing anything to celebrate that album? Um, and two, like maybe, you know, play it in its entirety for a tour or something like that, please. Or uh, maybe, um, do you have like any good memories? Like take me back to 2002. So at this point, I'm in second grade or third grade, uh, whether it came out in the spring or fall, I'm still in elementary school. But like, take me back to what was the idea for the debut of a trade with Suicide Notes and Butterfly Kisses as well? When we wrote that record, I mean, we were actually kind of, we were struggling a little bit with what to put on the record and like what directions to go with us. Because like I was saying before, we have so many styles that we wanted to go or get so many styles of music that we love and wanted to get into our band. But at the same time, we're like, holy shit, we just got signed. You know, we did it with a Trey, a Trey of all the bands we were jammed with. Trey was the one that, you know, like we felt had the most chance. And of course that's what got us signed. And we're like, all right, now that we have this opportunity, like, do we just stay as brutal as we were before? Because before that, we had our, um, you know, a Fractures in the Facade of Your Porcelain Beauty, which we put out on Tribunal ourselves kind of thing. Um, we recorded it our, ourselves, I should say. Um, that came out pretty quickly or, or soon um, before the Suicide Notes release. And that was a pretty brutal release for us. Probably one of the most brutal things it's we ever put out. death metal. Um, but even if you go back even before that and you listen to Visions, our, which we put out in 1999, um, there's, that doesn't feel like any other Trey record either. And there's a lot more kind of melodic and interesting things going on 
in there. It's more punk, really. It's got more of a punk feel. Um, so going into Suicide Notes, it was like, all right, like we we need to have all those elements because that's what got assigned, you know, is like this being this kind of uh, well, metalcore wasn't a thing yet as far as that term didn't exist, but we were essentially a metalcore band and that's what got assigned. So it was like, well, okay, we need to do this, but we were trying to at the same time kind of push our melodic side a little bit. We've always been like just on the edge of like, how can we get more melody in there? We want more melody. We don't want to just be screaming the whole time. Um, so you can kind of hear that coming out, even on a, you know, like songs like Ain't Love Grand, you know, like that song when we first wrote that, it, the chorus, every the song was exactly how it was. It's just the, the, the vocals on the chorus didn't exist. It was supposed to just be like a jam part. And it wasn't until we went in with Eric Rachel who produced it that was like, we got to that part of the song and it was like, you guys probably should write like a chorus over this. This is just a chorus with no chorus over it. We're like, huh, I guess we never thought about it that way. So we, uh, when, you know, my, myself and Brandon went into the other room and came up with a melody for it. Alex came up with some lyrics and, and uh, that became our first single off of uh, Suicide Notes. And um, all the other songs, like a lot of them we were taking from Fractures. You know, we took it from the previous EP because we just didn't have enough material. Or like at the time, like we weren't as fast and, and efficient at writing songs. It, was, it took a little bit more work. So, uh, you know, we're like, man, how are we going to come up with all this material for our debut album? You know, so we put a couple songs like Tulips Are Better, uh, Someone's Standing in My Chest. Um, those were songs, you know, from from our EP that we just carried over and re-recorded them better. Wow. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, that's kind of that album kind of came together, you know, not really knowing what the hell we were doing and just uh, trying to ride this opportunity out and hoping something worked. Yeah, and who? And then we would get great albums such as Lead Sail, Paper Anchor, De- uh, you know, Death Grip on Yesterday. And but like, is there any chance? is there any chance we could get some sort of celebration of that album? Because that album, like, I put that album on the level of, you know, albums such as Kill Switch Engages End of Heartache or Alive or Just Breathing or, uh, you know, albums such as Of One Blood by Shadows Fall or even Frail Words Claps by As I Lay Dying. Can you maybe see yourselves doing, like, a celebratory sort of thing? If you're allowed to say, of course. Uh, for Suicide Notes? Yeah, we could probably, probably something. I mean, we're always you know, looking for opportunities, you know, like any band when you're, you know, looking for reasons to, to tour or to, you know, do a, a cool merch drop or just a cool event or something, you know, like having things, whether it be like holidays or um, if not a holiday, things like, you know, releasing an album or celebrating the release of a past album. Um, you know, we did a tour for Death Grip on Yesterday's, I think it was the 10 year of it. Maybe it was the 15 year. I can't remember anymore. It's been so many years, I don't know. But yeah. we did like a 10 or 15 year thing for Death Grip on yesterday. We've, we've done a, uh, for Lead Sales Paper Anchor, we did a live stream where we played it in its entirety. Um, Cause that was, that came up as being, I don't even know, maybe that one was 15 years old. Yeah. Well, yeah, but usually we, we try to, you know, shine some light on stuff. We did a Curse 10 year um, show or we played the album front to back, including like Bon Jovi and any other kind of tracks that were going on around that time. Um, so yeah, I mean, it'd be fun. It'd be, it's been a while since we played every song on Suicide Notes. I mean, I don't even, you know, but the only time we've ever played them all live is when we were, um, you know, touring back then on that album. Cause as soon as you start putting out other albums, you know, you, you it's very rare that you play any album in its entirety again, cause you start having to throw in all these other songs and. At this point in our career, it's like, hard, I mean, we're lucky if we can get one song from each album on there, you know, it's just so many songs to try to incorporate. Yeah, I know. And it, it gets, <clears throat> it, and it only gets harder and harder and harder. Yeah. Yeah. Especially if you're playing a show where it's like, you got a 30 minute set. It's like, how are we supposed to squeeze, you know, 20 plus years, nine, you know, eight, nine albums worth of songs into 30 minutes? You know, it's like, you just kind of have to, a lot of stuff's not going to make the cut, unfortunately, but. Yeah, it is what it is. Definitely. And uh, the final question I wanted to ask you is, is, you know, this is a new era of Atreya with Brendan coming as the front man and really, really excited because he has a great voice. It'll be great to be able to see him, you know, present those vocals, um, you know, out from behind the kit, you know, and not being behind the kit the whole time. Could Baptize maybe be a good representation of what we're going to see from Atreya for years on end, if I'm not asking that too far in advance? Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, you know, especially switching to having Brandon come up front, you know, um, 
it's something that he's been very experienced with doing it for his other band, Hell or High Water, uh, as well as um, we've done this lineup before um, in Europe and got to try it out just to see how it would go. And, and that's also was kind of like the catalyst of us choosing to go with this lineup once we lost Alex because it went, it worked so well in Europe. I mean, the basic the story was Alex's um, back. He has a bad back. Uh, and about two weeks before our last time we went to Europe, which was a couple years ago now, he uh, he was he had to bail out on the tour. He's like, I can't do it, guys. My back's screwed up. And, you know, we, I, I can't go. And, of course, we're like, this is our only chance to go on this record cycle. Like, we have to go. It's going to screw up our presence over there. You know, we, we need to go. So we're like, what, what can we do? And we're like, why don't we do bringing Brandon up front? Because he's, you know, the voice anyways. And he's... Um, had experience doing it with Hell or High Water, so it's not completely foreign to him by any means. He's kind of been practicing essentially for the past like five years. And then Kyle Rosa, who has been playing drums for Brandon's band, Hell or High Water, it was another person that we were really familiar with because not only had Brandon played with him a bunch, but he was also our touring drum tech a lot of the time. So we all knew Kyle and had been around him and he knew our set. He kind of knew a lot about how we did everything because he was there sending up the drums and around it all the time. So we called on him and we went to Europe with him and had an, just an incredible time. I mean, it was so much fun. One of the funnest tours we've, we've had in a long time. And, um, you know, he's really easy to work with and he's fun on stage. He's a great performer. And it just allowed us to see this other side of our band that we'd never seen before. And, you know, we, we felt more confident almost than we'd ever had been. It, it was just this whole thing. We we're like, holy crap, this was a way more uh, eye-opening experience than we ever thought, you know? So then fast forward, you know, to just last year when we ended up parting ways with Alex, it was like, all right, well, what are we going to do? We're like, oh, we have to just, let's just get Kyle Rosa and do what we're doing in Europe. That was awesome. And that worked great. And, uh, you know, moving forward, it, it, it allows us, you know, as we've come to find out now that we've been working with him, um, just a lot more opportunity, a lot more things that we can try. There's a lot more tricks in our back pocket now um, that some that are new tricks, some that are ones that have been there forever and we just never you know had the opportunity to use them and never felt comfortable using them but now it does so we're uh we're you know it, it's uh the representation that we're getting now is definitely going to be a just a you know the tip of the iceberg of all the awesome stuff that's going to be coming up in the future now that we uh are going to be writing more records with this lineup awesome well before we go i want to thank you so much for your time today and uh thanks again for another uh, great conversation uh still enjoyed the uh one we did from 2018 is there just uh anything else that you would like to promote in terms of shows you know um you know knocking on wood that it all happens but uh i know that you're scheduled for aftershock um is there just anything else that you'd like to plug but um yeah other than that uh we don't have anything we, we can announce yet we're still we're working on some stuff you know we'd love to go on tour so we're uh, we're trying to see if we can put something together but uh nothing uh nothing in stone yet or nothing that i can uh, talk about or anything yeah well, thank you so much, Dan. Everybody, Dan of Atreo, be sure to check out Baptized coming out this June on Spine Farm Records. This is Alex from Heavy New York, and we will see you next time.